serial killer Angus Sinclair died in prison one year ago. A predator, paedophile and rapist, he spent the last 37 years of his life behind bars after evading police for decades. I just think it was evil. Pure evil. I don't think it was human. Who could do that to all these people? A very, very sly, devious man. He was very, very cunning. And he certainly outwitted a lot of supposedly cleverer people. Serial killers do not have gaps unless they're in custody. There was nothing to stop Sinclair from 1970 forward until he was arrested in 1982. Tonight, we hear disturbing claims about the life and crimes of Angus Robertson Sinclair. of people visit here each year, the ancient heart of Edinburgh's old town. But few will know what happened in that pub more than 40 years ago. Serial killer Angus Sinclair and his brother-in-law Gordon Hamilton targeted two teenage friends on a night out. Christine Eady and Helen Scott were lured to their deaths. Their bodies were bound, beaten, raped and strangled and dumped in East Lothian. Hamilton died before ever facing justice. It took 37 years before Angus Sinclair was finally convicted of what became known as the World's End Murders. With this weekend marking the first anniversary of Angus Sinclair's death, many disturbing questions remain unanswered. We still don't know how many lives he claimed. Tonight we're asking, is Angus Sinclair Scotland's luckiest serial killer? Chris Clark is a retired police intelligence officer turned author who's researching a book about the life and crimes of Angus Sinclair and Gordon Hamilton, who died in 1996. Angus Sinclair was a travelling criminal. On one occasion, he, he travelled over 100 miles to the, um, the fishing area that he and his brother in law went to and across several police boundaries. And there wasn't the mechanism uh, in those days to, to target um, and. An, so where the deposition site was, was completely different from the abduction area. Different police forces, and this was part of the problem. Uh, also, the, the forensic uh, ability in those days was quite poor. Um, the exhibits that were retained uh, were, were not handled properly, and in many cases uh, were, were lost. It says on there to the chief superintendent, Peter McLeod was a detective in Strathclyde Police Intelligence Bureau in 2001, where he was tasked with examining unsolved murders. At the time, Angus Sinclair was in prison for the rape and sexual assault of 11 children aged 6 to 14. He was due to stand trial and would be convicted for the 1978 murder of 17-year-old Mary Gallagher in Glasgow. McLeod wrote this document, a briefing paper, in which he suggested Sinclair should be investigated for the 1977 murders of Anna Kenny, Hilda McCauley and Agnes Cooney. All three women had been abducted and killed after nights out in the Glasgow area. To this day, these murders remain unsolved. Sinclair killed Helen Scott and Christine Eady in October 1977. The young women were abducted, bound, raped and killed. Then there is the death of teenage mother Leslie Perry, whose body was found in Woodland in Lanarkshire in July 1977. An official inquiry recorded an open verdict, but her family remained convinced she was murdered. Peter McLeod is certain that Sinclair claimed many more lives than the four he was convicted of. I would say quite a lot of murders, uh, up to maybe 14, I would say, possibly, and maybe more. Well, that's... Throughout Scotland. That's a dramatic figure. It is, yes. But there's a lot of these crimes are very similar MOs, 
that certainly would indicate it was Angus Sinclair. However, this is not simply a disturbing story about Sinclair allegedly getting away with murders. A report raises questions about alleged miscarriages of justice. These, we are told, allowed Sinclair to continue his killing spree. In June 1977, Frances Barker was abducted in Glasgow, raped and murdered. Her body was dumped in Lanarkshire. Lorry driver Thomas Ross Young was a serial sex offender who was found guilty of murdering Francis and died in prison six years ago, still protesting his innocence. To many, Sinclair was the real killer. Thomas Ross Young was convicted of the June 1997 murder of Francis Barker, but you have a different theory. What is that? Francis Barker lived about a quarter of a mile away from Sinclair's mother and uh, Sinclair even though he was married at the time, would very often stay with his mother and at, in, during periods when he'd separate from his wife, he would go and live with his mother. So he had plenty of opportunity to, to maybe have seen Frances Barker previously on the street. She was taken to a wooded area in Glen Boyd. Her body was found a few weeks later. She'd been strangled with items of her own clothing, gagged and her wrists tied behind her back. When you look at Frances Barker's murder in relation to the other ladies who met the fate the same year, it's, it's identical in the way Frances was abducted and where her deposition was and the manner in which she was left. And also there was a very close um, involvement with Sinclair's mother to the victim's address. When Peter MacLeod wrote this memo, he expected that it would be acted upon. Instead, he says, there was no appetite to do so, that it was effectively buried, and that senior officers then attempted to force him out of his job. But why? I could only surmise. What do you surmise? My surmise it was to protect uh, certain crimes where people had been wrongly convicted and that they wouldn't come to light as a result of uh, that being discovered. So this is a fairly serious point. Are you accusing senior officers of blocking further investigation, resulting in a miscarriage of justice? Well, I, I can see no other explanation for it. There was no DNA available until the mid-1980s, and the, um, the, the cases were basically um, dealt with by local police. They were looking at local um, criminals for, for them and time and time again, they, they miss Angus Sinclair. Throughout the 1970s, Sinclair, often with his brother-in-law, prowled Scotland in search of victims. But he was just 16 when he first raped and killed. His victim was seven-year-old Catherine Rehill, who was visiting family here on the street where Sinclair lived. 50 years on from that horrific day, her cousin Anne Summers has given her first TV interview and says she has slim hopes that answers will ever be forthcoming. Beverly sisters, never in a million years would you ever think that would happen. You know what I mean? Until one day it did happen, it was really bad because we were all close and my uncle Pat just up and left then when it happened. He couldn't live with himself. I remember the police coming to the door. Yeah, I remember that. It was chaotic. It was really bad. Everybody didn't know what to do, they couldn't believe it, and people thought it was me because we looked alike. But, um, and that's when we had to all go to Glasgow. And then I remember getting told what happened to her, and that was horrible because I was only a wee lassie. But uh, it was hard for her to believe that she wasn't there anymore. Despite explicit warnings that Sinclair posed a certain danger to the public, he was released after serving six years of a 10-year sentence for culpable homicide. Catherine's family have never understood why he was freed so quickly. As soon as I heard he was out, I said he'd do it again. We all said that. We all said he'll do it again, God help the people he does it to. That's the very words that were said. And the two girls fed in Borough, and they were trying him for that. As soon as it happened, I said it's him. Well, I said, OK, he murdered Catherine and their family suffered so much, but think of the other families as well, and he still got away with murdering people. 
I don't understand it. I'll never understand it. What did the psychiatrist say at the time? The psychiatrist, when he was accused of the murder of Catherine Rehill, said that uh, although he wasn't a simpleton, he was of below average intelligence. And in his view, he was of, uh, obsessed with sex and at the first opportunity would re-offend. Serial killers do not have gaps unless they're in custody. And there, there was uh, nothing to stop Sinclair from 1970 forward until he was arrested in 1982. If Angus Sinclair had been caught during that spate of killings, what do you think would then have happened? What would have changed? The murders would have ceased. I would be almost certain of that. Francis Barker was the first of up to eight victims in a spate of murders throughout 1977 and 78. It took four months to convict Thomas Ross Young for her murder, but the killings did not stop. Peter McLeod believes Sinclair would have had no concerns about the injustice of another man jailed for a murder he committed. No concern for the other individuals, more about his own standing. Only his own standing as, for, as a serial killer. But the timing of the World's End murder may tell us something about Sinclair's mindset, about a serial killer's need for recognition, for everyone to see how clever he was. Christy Needy and Helen Scott were killed over a weekend in October 1977. The following Monday morning, the trial of Thomas Ross Young began. It was Sinclair's idea to cause a grandstand situation where he uh, murdered, did the World's End murders, and everyone was reading about them the same day as the murder trial of Thomas Ross Young for Francis Barker was starting. Because Sinclair was offended that he wasn't yeah, getting the Yeah, he, he, was, he wasn't getting the credit for his own handiwork. George Beatty, now 66 years of age, was convicted of murdering Margaret McLaughlin in 1973 in Carluc in Lanarkshire. I knew Margaret for years in our family. Did you commit that murder? No, I did not commit that murder. Margaret's body was found in an area known as Colonel's Glen. It was a bloody and brutal attack. She was stabbed 19 times. Beatty was 19 at the time and known locally as a big safty. He spent more than 20 years behind bars and now lives in England. The way I was treated with uh, the Lancashire police at that time, um, the time that the interviews went through and that, uh, the time they finished me, I was, well, I would say I was punch drunk because they used towels around their hands. I can remember them banging off with the lockers and then lift my hair and push me into water, down below the water and that. Uh, but nobody's been interested in that. Uh, to me, at that time, I should not have been interviewed without a, a lawyer, but in their days, there was no such a thing as lawyers or tapes or anything like that. So basically, the, the Lanarkshire police could do whatever they want. I started work on George's case in uh, 1982, about 10 years after he was convicted. George Beatty has fought to clear his name for the past 47 years. None of it fits. I'm sorry, it would go, I can't tell you two hours of evidence in 10 seconds. But basically there was very, very bad, wrong police work done here. His case was the subject of documentaries produced by veteran investigative journalist Peter Hill, who continues to fight his corner. George is innocent, but the main point about the case is that he can't possibly be guilty uh, because he's alibied for the whole time when the murder must have taken place. And also, all the way through, the police were lying about the evidence. They cooked up a story and they stuck with it and they actually elaborated it as they went to court. You believe he's innocent? Yes, without a doubt. The evidence alone that was present uh, was in no way sufficient to convict uh, George Beatty. Maybe he's alleged to have said things in response to uh, interrogation, but the evidence alone was non-existent. 
I've failed to understand how a jury managed to convict on, on the lack of evidence um, and the serious doubt that uh, George Beatty was capable of carrying such a crime. Had the case occurred in England, I'm, I'm quite confident that the appeal court would have, would have overturned and quashed the conviction. In 1993, the MP Jimmy Hood delivered a lengthy speech to the House of Commons about the case. My adjournment debate tonight is about a young 19-year-old Kirluk boy who was convicted of murder in 1973. A simple lad, not very well educated. He was known in Kirluk as a big softy. Much of Jimmy Hood's speech was about this man, Chief Superintendent William Munsey, who was in charge of the murder investigation. Munsey was perhaps the most famous police officer of the era due to his role in helping capture the 1950s serial killer Peter Manuel. However, campaigners have long claimed that in securing Beatty's conviction for murder, he perverted the course of justice by bending evidence to fit his flawed theory. The Beatty case was the 54th and final murder of Muncie's detective career before his elevation to managerial ranks. It wouldn't be nice to say that this officer of such a high reputation actually deliberately lied so as to make sure that his last case ended in a conviction and so ensuring him a 100% success record before he left for one of the highest ranking police jobs in Scotland. But we might excuse George Beatty, who's in his cell in Salton Prison tonight, for thinking that. Beatty is not in Salton Prison because he committed a murder in Kaluk in 1973. He is in jail because if the truth come out, too many reputations will suffer in high places. That is the sad truth. And it is something that the Scottish office and its ministers must stand up to and answer. They have hidden behind them any complications and twists and turns in the story of George Beatty. They must now realise that the guilty verdict was a miscarriage of justice. I hope today that the right verdict will come out with the judges this morning. And end a nightmare for you? Yes. It's been a long nightmare, a long 21 years. So I hope today it finishes it all. George Beatty has twice taken his case to the appeal court, but on both occasions failed to overturn his conviction for murder. Um, I think that, that uh, it's been set in concrete and there's nobody interested. I would like it to be clear before I pass on, but that is something that's beyond my expectations. I feel that there's no much time left now. My mother died. And I would like to have to have to see me cleared, but that wasn't to be, you know. I think actually, if I'd, I would have had a better life, I didn't have this and that. I think I would have been still in Scotland, and I think I would have married in Scotland. Uh, my sweetheart's now married, you know, it's, but I would have married her. Um, because we were school friends and we used to live next door to one another when I went to Lockett Street. And, um, but she's now gone now. I spoke at length to Rosemary McLaughlin, um, Margaret's sister, and I heard of the effect of all this on her. As a consequence of that, I actually went down to the cemetery in Carluke, I found Margaret's grave and I vowed to Margaret that I would try to find the actual murderer if I could. It wasn't my job, but I'd try to do it. Uh, because I didn't like, just as Rosemary, I didn't like walking around Carluk, going down to Lanark and thinking that the murderer who killed that lovely girl was still walking free. And he was. He must have laughed all the way out of the court in Glasgow when George was convicted. And I can get away with it, he thought, because there are idiots like George Beatty who'll get convicted for it. Don't worry, I'll go and do another one. And I think that's what happened. Who do you think was being protected? Well, let's obviously the senior officers who were in charge of the murders that resulted in a wrongful conviction. Munsey was a respected and even celebrated officer. You realise the significance of what you're saying here? I do, yes. But the facts speak for themselves. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There's, uh, the, the George Beatty could never have committed that murder, I don't think. Angus Sinclair was tried but acquitted of the World's End murders in 2007. 
a scrapping of Scotland's double jeopardy law, which prevented anyone being tried again for the same crime, led to Sinclair being put back in the dock in 2014. He was then found guilty of murdering Christine Eady and Helen Scott. Whatever dreams they had, they turned into nightmares shortly after they left the World's End pub. Little were they to know that they had the misfortune to be in the company of two men for whom the words evil and monster seem inadequate. The girls were subjected to an ordeal beyond comprehension and then left like carrion, exposed for all to see with no dignity, even in death. You are a dangerous predator who is capable of sinking to the depths of depravity. It's justice for the girls. It's what I've always wanted. I promised my late wife I would fight to the end of my days. And uh, it'll be closure, I hope, for some of my family. It'll never be closure for me because I saw Helen that night when she was came up, was brought up from me slow there. And I'll never forget, as long as I live, what I saw that day, what they had done to my beautiful daughter. Sinclair is responsible for the carnage he caused, for the immeasurable pain he inflicted, for the countless lives he destroyed. We have spoken to several families who have never had justice. Having lived with unimaginable pain and trauma for decades, they have no desire to put themselves in the public spotlight. But they also tell us privately that even though Angus Robertson Sinclair is dead, far too many questions remain unanswered. If what you're saying is correct, then Angus Sinclair is one of the most prolific serial killers in Scottish history, yes. if not the most. Yeah. Have his victims, in your view, been, been served? No. No. Have they had justice? Definitely not. While the past cannot be changed, the families and some former police officers think the authorities can still do the right thing by apologising for past mistakes and providing some honest answers. The death of Angus Sinclair was subject to a fatal accident inquiry this week. Is it time that the families who suffer from Scotland's luckiest serial killer finally get the answers they deserve? When he murdered Catherine, he should never get out. So I think there should be an inquiry into how he got off for so long. I believe they, they could mount a public inquiry, look at the links. The similar fact evidence connects all of the cases. We asked Police Scotland about George Beattie and Thomas Ross Young and other concerns raised in our programme. In response, they said both murders were investigated by Legacy Force Strathclyde Police, resulting in convictions. They also invited anyone with new information to contact them. Scottish society has changed beyond recognition since the 1970s, while the pain caused by Angus Sinclair diminishes with each passing year. Angus Robertson Sinclair was a predator, a paedophile, a rapist and murderer whose depraved reign of terror scarred Scotland. Is it now time to consign his name to history and move on? Or is it right that questions should be answered, no matter how difficult that may be?